Okay, so um, today we are dealing with uh, chapter three. This is all about probability, okay? And how we define probability uh, has implications on how we do our statistical inference later down the road. And so in our class, we take, this is um, an introductory class, so we take the classical view of prob probability, okay? So in, our, in this course, we use the classical, and it's known as the frequentist view probability. Okay, and so uh, in you know the last several decades, uh, some advancements in statistics have been made, and you know. The idea, uh, beige, the Bayesian view of probability um, has caught on and become more popular and things like that. Um, and I kind of compare this to, you know, if you take physics, your first physics class will be probably Newtonian physics. You know, you learn about acceleration and all of that stuff, and, uh, and it works, okay? But then, you know, maybe later on you learn about general relativity and special relativity and how as you know things approach the speed of light the rules of Newtonian physics break down and you have all these more complicated things okay well <coughs> so as because this is an introductory course we're going to just start with the the basic view of this frequentist um, view of probability and that's all we're going to cover and I'll um, but if you take more classes in statistics or probability you might encounter the Bayesian point of view. Okay, and so when we talk about probability, you know, we're, um, uh, you know what, let me adjust this one setting here, just so my screen doesn't uh, change colors here. Um, when we say something like, um, if I flip a coin, the probability that it will land on heads is 0.5, okay? And I, I don't think this statement is mind-blowing to any of you. So 50%. Uh, 50 percent. Um, generally, probabilities are expressed as decimals between 0 and 1. You could say 50 percent, though. That's fine, okay? So any percentage could be expressed as a decimal and vice versa. And so we might say, if I flip a coin, the probability that it will land on heads is 0.5. Um, but what exactly does this mean? Now, we have other words. We have synonyms for the word probability. We can also say the chance that the coin lands on heads is 0.5, or the likelihood that it lands on the that it land, that will land on heads is 0.5. These are all kind of the same same sentence here, okay? But what does it mean when we say the chance is 0.5, or the likelihood is 0.5, or the probability is 0.5, okay? And so here, this is why we call it the frequentist view of probability we're going to take in the notion of the long run relative frequency. Okay? The long run relative frequency. And the idea is this. Um, if I were to sit and flip a coin um, 10 times, Okay, it might land heads five times, and it might land heads uh, tails five times, but it also might land heads six times, or it might land heads three times. Okay, and so in those cases, I might get 
30% heads or 60% heads. I might get 50% heads, okay? But there, there's a decent amount of chance that it's not going to be exactly 50%, okay? But if I flip the coin um, a thousand times, okay, I'm, it's, I probably won't see 600 heads, okay? I might see 502 heads, I might see 510 heads, but I'm probably not going to see 600 heads, and I'm certainly not going to see 300 heads if I'm fl flipping a coin a thousand times. And if I flip it a million times, the percentage of heads that I get, or the proportion of heads that I get, will be very close to 0.5. Maybe not exactly so, but it will get very close. And, and the idea is if we do this an infinite number of times, which is not practically possible, but if we flip the coin an infinite number of times, the number, the relative frequency, or the proportion of heads that I see it approach is going to be the probability of the event. Well, something like uh, coin tossing, you, you can you can kind of uh, you, uh, use that over like a population. You can use a coin toss over millions of representing a uh, number of times. You can go for a complete parameter almost of it. Yeah, so, so we can do it millions of times. It's still not an infinite number, okay? Um, we'll never, even if we had all the atoms in the universe, that's still not an in, that's still not infinity. So uh, the idea is, as we approach infinity, the relative frequency that we observe is our probability. Now, what about if you have six billion people flipping a coin one time? E even six billion, as large as that number is, is not infinity. Okay, so oh, okay. we're 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 just so the idea, there's a notion of infinity here, okay? So as we perform many, many coin flips, uh, so approach infinity, the relative frequency of the event is the probability of the event. Okay. So, you know, again, relative frequency. would be the number of times the event happens divided by the number of times the event could have happened. And so this is how we're going to define probability. Okay, so when we say um, the probability of an event, we're talking about the long run relative frequency. Now this definition of probability works well when we're talking about coin flips or events that are easily repeated. But then if we talk about, you know, what is the probability that um, temperatures on Earth rise three degrees in the next ten years, okay? We don't have an infinite number of duplicate Earths or, uh, you know, we, there's only one Earth, and so it's a little bit um, tricky there, but we have to take into, um, or if some, you know, 
if the doctor says you have this disease and the probability you survive longer than five years is 10%, you know, what does that mean? And we have, with this long run relative frequency, we have to kind of take on this, you know, sci-fi notion of if we had an infinite number of parallel universes and, and we just see what happens in each of these things, in some of these universes, in about 10% of them, you would survive longer than five years, and then the other 90% you wouldn't. Or, and, you know, in some of these universes, the Earth's temperature would rise three degrees, and in other universes, it wouldn't. Um, so uh, we kind of have to take on this idea that we could repeat things. And of course, you know, on a physical level, that, that might not be, uh, be possible. OK? So here we go, okay. Um, in the book, you'll see a graph that kind of looks like, you know, this, something like this, okay? And this is, um, what this has on this axis is a number of trials, And this would be, um, and on this side would be the relative frequency. Like exponentially. Uh, no, 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 this just. So the idea is that in the beginning, when you only have a few trials going on, uh, the relative frequency fluctuates. So, for example, you know, maybe on your, you know, coin flip one. The first one, maybe you get tails, okay? And so here your relative frequency is 0 out of 1 or 0 percent, relative frequency of heads. And if your second coin flip is heads, now it's 1 out of 2 and your relative frequency is 50 percent or 0.5. And if the third one is heads, then it's 2 out of 3, and your relative frequency is 0.67. And as, so in the beginning, these numbers jump around quite a bit. Maybe we get tails again, and now I, my relative frequency is 2 out of 4, and I have 0.5. So in the beginning, these numbers jump around, but you know, as we get to like, let's say the 99th coin flip, let's say it's heads, and I have 49 out of 99, this is going to be like uh, 0.498 or something like that. I'm making up a number. And the 100th coin flip could be um, tails, and it would be 49 out of 100. And my relative frequency would be 0.49. So in the beginning, it jumps around a lot, but after 100 or so, or after many more trials, it doesn't bounce around as much, okay? And so you, you kind of see this smoothing out here, okay? So lots of fluctuation, and then later on, less fluctuation. Is that all right? Okay. Oh, and, and so um, that was the other picture we had, huh? Stats, Excel, 13. Oh, what happened? Um, and so, sorry, there's, it kind of approaches maybe like an asymptote of some, some sort. This value that it approaches would be the probability, OK? 
Okay, so this the uh, true probability of the event. Okay. So maybe I'll, I'll just briefly describe the law of large numbers. And so the law of large numbers kind of goes right along with our frequentist definition of probability. And it's just that, um, so we might sometimes when we um, observe things, we might talk about an empirical probability. And an empirical probability is just another way of saying the relative frequency when we do the trials ourselves. Okay, so let me just define empirical probability. This is uh, the relative frequency of said event many trials are repeated in real life. Okay, or or a simulation, I suppose. And this is versus the theoretic probability. This is probably the uh, true probability of the event. Event um, generally uh, generally found using um, the axioms or rules of probability. Okay. And so the law of large numbers says that if you repeat a thing, repeat trials many times, the empirical probability will approach the theoretic probability. Okay. So the law of large numbers states as you repeat an event many times, probability of relative frequency you observe will approach the theoretic probability. Okay. And so this is how insurance companies stay in business and casinos stay in business when, because they say, um, you know, the games at the casino are all um, designed in such a way that the uh, casino maintains a small edge in probability, okay? So um, if you play uh, roulette, they, they pay you as if you have a 50% chance of winning, but your true probability of winning is maybe 47%, okay? So... Um, so you win, so theoretically you win only 47% of the time, but the prize that you win is as if you won 50% um, of the time. And so that's how they, they, um, they maintain um, an edge. And, uh, and as more and more people play, um, the casinos win more money in the long run, okay? Now, as um, in the short term, you might get lucky, okay? And you might win five games in a row or something like that, okay? Or you might lose five games in a row. 
Now, there's nothing about the universe trying to balance things out. So there's something known as gambler's fallacy where it's like, oh, um, I lost 10 times in a row, so I am overdue for a win. Or, um, you know, in roulette, the, the ball can either land in a red spot or a black spot. And sometimes, um, you know, it might land in a red spot a whole bunch of times. And the, uh, the f poor thinking might say, oh, well, black is now overdue, or I'm overdue for a win, or something like that. And there's nothing in the universe, there's no um, force in the universe that says things have to even out in probability, okay? But how do we reconcile that with the law of large numbers, which states that it will approach the true theoretic probability? If, if our empirical probability after several things is we've won 0% of the time, when theoretically we should be winning 50% of the time, how do we um, say, and there's no, nothing that's going to balance it out, how does this work? The idea is that if you play it a whole bunch more times, okay, so after 10 games and you've lost all 10 and you're supposed to win half the time, it's not that you're overdue for a win and that it's going to try to balance things out. It's just that, okay, from here on out, the theoretic probability should be 50%. You should win about 50%. And if you play a million games winning 50%, 50 percent of those, that those numbers will overwhelm any odd fluctuations you saw in the beginning. Okay, so there's no trying to balance it out. It's just anything that happens in the future overwhelms anything odd that you saw in the beginning. Does that make sense? Or? But isn't that also kind of balancing it out? Um, well, so it's not... So the gambler's fallacy is that because I'm overdue for a win, it's like the probability that it's going to be black or uh, is greater now because oh. the all of these were oh, red so before. The probability never changed. The probability never changed. Right. Okay. It's just that in the future, the so the probability of winning is still going to be fifty percent or forty-seven percent or whatever it is. It's just that, and so even though maybe you were unlucky in the beginning. The, that probability doesn't change. You're not more likely to get this one or that one, okay? But, you know, you go to a roulette table in Vegas, and, and I love going to Vegas, by the way. Um, you go to a roulette table, they always have this board that shows kind of the past numbers that showed up. You know, it's like 36 showed up, and 15 showed up, and 5 showed up, and all. They show these things as if you can look at those numbers and have an idea what's going to come up next, okay? It doesn't matter. You can just close your eyes and then just pick a number, and that one is equally likely to win as any other number that someone picked from studying those things. Because every time you play, the, each number has the same probability. So the gambler's hope is equal to you're hoping for less, less fluctuation. Uh, they're, they're ho I guess, I don't, you know, I don't know what goes through a gambler's mind, but the, there's something known as gambler's fallacy, which is saying, you know, the chance of it turning, um, being black on the next one is higher now because of all these other past things, and that's just not the case. Okay, so let's, um, we're going to go through some of the theoretic rules of calculating probabilities, okay? And so um, we're going to just start off with by saying the probability of an EV of some event A happening A happening is represented as um, and there's a couple ways we can say probability of A or probability of A okay so sometimes there's an R and sometimes there's not. Um, and depending which textbook you use, they might show either one, okay? Our textbook throws in the R, other textbooks don't, and sometimes I might use one or the other. <laughs> okay, and so all probabilities
are between 0 and 1. Okay, and so the probability of A or any event is between 0 and 1 inclusive. Probability of A equals 0 means it never happens. Probability of A equal 1 means it always happens or is certain. Do I need to write that or? Sure. Okay. Then we define the complement. The complement of A is the event when A does not happen. Okay. So there are only two possibilities. Either A happens or it doesn't. So either A happens or its complement happens. Okay. Only two possibilities in the world or in the universe. So either A happens or the complement of A happens. Okay, and so that's where complement comes from. It's the idea of complete. Take A with its complement completes all possibilities. They complete each other. And so the probability, so the complement of A can be written as not A um, Complement of A can be written as not A, A with a C, or A prime. These are just different notations for saying the same thing. And we say that the probability, and I probably like not A the most, but so the probability of the complement of A is 1 minus the probability of A. Okay? So Notice um, we distinguish between the event and its probability. Okay, so the event is just written as a or b or not a or whatever it might be, and the probability of that thing is when we assign a number to it. Okay, and so, so let me just say a few things. So we could say um, we can define A as um, a coin lands on heads. Okay, so, and then we can say the probability of A is equal to 0.5, all right? Do not say A equals 0.5, OK? Because A is not the number 0.5. A is the event a coin lands on heads, OK? You can say the probability of A is 0.5, but don't say A is 0.5. So what is a complement? OK. So a complement to, I, I, and, I, and, uh, and I'm being pedantic here, but, um, but I, it is, uh, the coin does not land on heads, OK? So that would include the possibility that the coin 
vanishes midair because of some strange thing or whatever. Now we can say, uh huh? It could land on its side, things like that. So, so you can simplify and just say we're going to assume that there's only two possibilities: that it lands on heads or tails. But um, the, to be technical, the complement is that it does not land on heads. And those are the only two possibilities that could happen. Either the coin lands on heads or something else happens. Okay? And we can say, well, if it doesn't land on heads, that means it lands on tails. Um, and so we would say the probability of A complement or not A or whatever you want to say would be 1 minus 0.5 which is also 0.5. Okay. And uh, and then so now we can combine events and and all sorts of stuff. Um, so, okay, so let's talk about simple events with simple outcomes. Okay, so events with simple outcomes are cases where the individual outcomes each are equally likely, okay? So simple outcomes. each outcome is equally likely. So examples, coin flip. Outcomes, heads, tails, each, each of those are equally likely. Another example, uh, a die roll. Outcomes, the numbers 1 through 6, in each are like equally likely. Or um, selecting a random individual from a crowd. Okay, and outcomes are is each person, each person, and the idea is each person has the same chance of being selected. Okay, so we could ask us a question like. Um, what is the probability that um, a die rolls? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, that a rolled die lands on uh, five or six. Okay, and so the answer, so the probability. Die lands on five or six is equal to uh, number of simple outcomes in the event divided by total number of simple outcomes. So this is, so there are two events, five and a six, that qualify as the die landing on five or six out of six possible outcomes. So the probability that the die rolls on a five or six is one out of three. Okay, so that, that was easy enough. All right, so just very quickly, I'm assuming you guys are familiar with a deck of cards? Okay, so. I could say um, we pick a card at random, pick a card at random 
from standard 52 card deck. Okay, what is the probability? It is a face card. So face card is uh, a jack, a queen, or a king. Okay. Ace is not a face card. There's no, no face on the ace. High value card. Okay, and what is our answer? 12 out of 52, right? We have jack, queen, king, uh, each in four suits. So a total of 12 cards. So 12 out of 52, or 3 out of 13. And whatever decimal equivalent that is. I can. Okay. Is this okay? Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I like to keep four decimal places at least, um, but it's kind of, it doesn't really matter. Um, sometimes we like to keep a lot of decimals, and um, but it doesn't really make sense. There, if, in that book, did I talk about what is a p-value anyway? Uh, he talks about how they, you know, some place reported that the average length of pregnancy is thirty nine point, you know, five six seven weeks or something like that. Okay. Now, if you look at what point five six seven of a week is, you know, thirty nine point five six seven as you know, as if we have all these decimals of precision, you know, it makes. Um, the difference between 0.567 and 0.568 is like, you know, a few minutes, okay? And, and any jokes, you know, that, re that would require some very personal questions um, if, if we wanted to know the exact length of pregnancy. But uh, it's just, you know, in, in context of real life, maybe it doesn't matter having all of these decimals, okay? But our calculator spits them out, so we like to use them, but, uh, you know. It's fine. They got to the moon using slide rules, which don't uh, give that much precision. So, uh, okay. So let's um, let's talk about other things. Okay. So let's say um, you roll a pair of dice. Okay. So you roll two dice, and ask something like, "What is the probability?" that the sum of the dice is 6 or 8, okay? So if you play Settlers of Catan, <laughs> um, you, you get your, uh, the 6 and the 8 are the, um, the cash cows in terms of research generation. So what's the probability that you get a 6 or an 8, okay? Well, how do we answer this? It's two die. Yeah, yeah it's two die. Okay, so I'll tell you what the wrong way is. Okay, so the wrong way that I'm going to use is to say, okay, well, the outcomes are dot 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 dot. Uh, you can get a two, a three, a four, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12. 
and the wrong way would say, okay, well, we're going to look at the 6 and the 8. So we have a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 outcomes. So the probability of a 6 or 8 is 2 out of 11. Okay, so this is wrong. And what is the, the big flaw here? Why is this wrong? Why doesn't this work? Because this method of how many outcomes out of total outcomes only works if each of these outcomes are equally likely. Okay? And anybody who's played any game with two dice, be it Monopoly, Catan, or, or Craps, you know that rolling a 12 does not have the same probability of, as rolling a 7. Kind of like Yahtzee in a way. Yeah, so. All of these different, um, these are not equally likely, okay? So these outcomes okay, and so we would actually have to build a grid of outcomes Okay, and then you you know, and, uh, and each of these outcomes are then equally likely. You know, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And so we have sixes and we have eights. So there, here there are 36 outcomes, okay? And all 36 are equally likely. Okay, and I'm going to draw um, kind of a green box around or a green circle around our sixes and eights. And so here we see, oh, there's uh, 10. 10 outcomes of six and eight. So the probability of a six or an eight would be 10 out of 36. Flip to the next. Uh, so this would be correct. Okay. Uh, more rules. Okay. So we might ask about um, or events and and events. So here we're um, combining uh, multiple events. So I said, what's the probability of getting a 6 or an 8? OK. Um, you know. And in English, the word or is a little bit ambiguous, okay? Um, 
and I can ask you two questions, and the way I phrase it, or the way I um, put stress on the syllables would, would change your answers, right? So I could say, do you like, do you, uh, do you like chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream? And your answers would be, what? Both. I like chocolate ice cream or something like that, okay? Um, but if I said, do you like chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream? Your answer might be yes or no, okay? And so uh, in English when we say or, we might mean choose one or the other, okay? But in probability and statistics when we say or, we're always implying an and or, okay? So when we say or, it means this or this or both. Okay, so the or in statistics is always uh, an and or. So, do you like chocolate or vanilla ice cream? Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, when we ta talk about events, okay, what is the probability of A or B? This is what is the probability that A happens or B happens? or both happens. Okay, so, and the uh, formula or equation for calculating a probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus any overlap for probability of A and B. Okay. And um, when you use probability of A and B, is it probably of A plus B? No, uh, so I'll get into that, okay? So A and B is um, both A and B, okay? So here's an example. Um, let's say there's a room of 100 people. Okay, 30 um, Thirty people uh, Let's see, let, let me change this. Okay, so we asked them We asked, do you have a dog? Thirty said yes We asked, do you have a cat? 30. And we'll say uh, 35 said yes. And I will also give you another piece of information. We'll say um, 10 people answered yes to both. And so now the question is, um, how many people own a cat or a dog? Or I could rephrase this. If I pick one person at random out of the 100 people, what's the probability I get someone who owns a cat or a dog? OK. 
And so what do you guys, what do you think here? 40 people have a cat and 45 people have a dog? No. Yeah, and so the answer here is a total of 55 people own a cat or a dog, okay? So I can, I can draw this little Venn diagram here. Okay. So this, so if we look at everybody in the Venn diagram, there should be 100 people total. And I'm going to have this over here be the dog circle. And this over here is the cat circle. Okay. How many people have both a cat and a dog? Ten, right? Okay. How many people total in the cat circle? Do you have a cat? Thirty-five said yes. Okay. So total in the cat circle would be thirty-five. So how many people are over here? How many people own a cat but no dog? Twenty-five. Okay. And how many people own a dog but no cat? Twenty. Okay. So how many people does that leave here with neither cat nor dog? Forty-five. Are we able to uh, complete this? Okay. And so, so with uh, if you can create the Venn diagram, you can answer all of these questions. How many people own a cat or a dog? Okay. Or, you know, if I select someone at random. what is the probability that the person uh, owns a cat uh, but has no dog? Okay, and the answer to that is 0.25 or, you know, probability of neither cat nor dog. And the answer to that would be 0. 0.45. And that's because, and, and so we can't just say, oh, 30 people own a dog and 35 own a cat, so probability of cat or dog is 30 plus 35, 65, okay, 0.65. We can't, we can't do that because um, there are people that might, um, might have answered yes to both, and we would be counting those twice. Question. Above that, or in statistics is always an and or. Uh huh. So wouldn't that mean that if you ask somebody do you, how many people own a cat or a dog, it would be and or. So. Yes. Yeah, so how? And or a dog. Right. Isn't that why do you take the ten people out? That's why. So so how many people own a cat, and or a dog, and the answer is, fifty five people own a cat and or a dog. So so right there there are twenty people who own dogs only, twenty five people who own cats only, and ten people who own both. Okay? So how many people so and or a dog means how many people own a cat or a dog or both? And the answer to that would be 20 plus 25 plus 10, which plus is 10. not plus 10. There's, there's, a, there's only 100, there's 100 people total here, right? Maybe I should just start out. How many people don't have a cat or a dog? 45. 45, right? So if I did 20 plus 25 plus 10 plus 10 plus 45, 
I would get 110. So that, that's not possible. Okay? So I have to... Uh, there's only 55 people here. There, it's not a... Uh, I'm not... I'm not doing... Um, I, I don't want to count these 10 people twice, which is why I'm subtracting them out. Okay? So I'm doing 30 plus 35 minus these 10 people here. Okay? Um... Like, I, okay, so I could ask, how many cards in the deck are red or diamonds? Okay, and so there's 26 red cards, and there's 13 diamond cards. Okay, now this, is a, this feels like a silly question, because it is. And because all 13 diamond cards are also red cards. Okay, so if I just say, how many cards in the deck are red or diamonds and or diamonds. So how many cards are red? How many cards are diamonds? How many card or how many cards are both? The answer is 26. So I'm not going to say 39 cuz cuz those all of those diamond cards count as red cards and and so uh, I wouldn't say 26 plus 13. I could do 20, it is, it would be 26 plus 13 minus 13 is, is what's happening, okay? So, and, but, you know, nobody would ask that because it just seems, that would feel silly, but, uh, but that's, that's essentially what's going on here, okay? Is that all right? So we also have um, a special case where um, we have what we call mutually exclusive. Okay, so mutually exclusive means the probability of A and B is equal to zero. Okay, A and B cannot happen together. So the diagram there would be A is over here and B is over here. Okay, so the probability of A or B for mutually exclusive events is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B but the probability of A and B this is zero so this simplifies to the probability of A or B is just the probability of A plus the probability of B. Okay? And so, um, here it could be, uh, you know, uh, you know, room of 100 people, and we will say, um, you know, We asked, do you have um, only one child? And let's say 20 people said yes, OK? And we said, do you have two children? OK, or is the number of kids you have two children? And we'll say 15 answered yes. Hey, I don't know. I don't know what room this is. Okay. And let's say this is, this is it. Okay. So then we say if we ask what's the probability that someone has one or two children, the answer would be 0.35, because 35 out of 100, right? 20 out of 100 plus 15 out of 100. Okay, and there's no overlap, because nobody can answer yes to, I have two children, and I have only one child. 
That's not possible. Can you show me how that translates into zero? Oh, okay, okay. So <coughs> just let's just think logically about this, right? If 15 of these 15 children, 15 people who said I have two children, could any of them have answered yes to do you have only one child? No. no. So so then how many, you know, how many said yes to both questions? Zero. And the answer is zero, okay? Um, now I don't, I shouldn't have to explicitly state this, right? Because based on these questions, we should know that it is impossible to say yes, or unless you are lying, mm -hmm. if you are being truthful, you cannot say yes to both, both questions. We also have, um, so let's talk about the and probabilities, okay? So the probabilities of A and B, okay? So this, I'm going to define something here, requires us to define a conditional probability. And it's going to look like this. The probability of B vertical bar A. And this is read as the probability of B. Um, and it's understood to say of B happening given the vertical bar uh, is means given, given A. Okay, so it, it is understood that A has happened. Okay, All right, so we'll just say probability of B given A. Okay, and so we say that the probability of A and B is equal, first, A has to happen, so we take the probability of A happening, and then we're going to multiply that by the probability of B given A. Okay, so essentially we're saying the probability of both A and B happening is equal to, well, so first A must happen and once A happens then B must also happen. Okay, and so for A to happen, that's the probability of A, and then, and once A happens, then B must also happen, that's gonna be the probability of B given A, okay? So the probability of A and B will never be larger than the probability of A by itself. If B always happens when A happens, then probability of A and B will just be the probability of A. But otherwise, probability of A and B is almost always a number smaller than the probability of A happening on its own. Because for A and B both to happen, first A has to happen, and maybe the probability of that is 0.6. And once A happens, then B has to happen on top of that. And that, if that is less than certain, then the probability of A and B both happening is going to be less than 0.6. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is 
the probability of A and B. We, we define this thing as the probability of B given A. And so um, uh, in a kind of a cyclical self, you know, self-defining -def thing, okay, sometimes we want to find this, and we have this piece of information, and we have this piece of information. Sometimes we want to find this piece of information, and we have the other pieces of information. So depending on what pieces of information you have, we might use this thing. Or using algebra, we can rearrange things. And if we wanted, if we wanted to find this probability, we can also find the probability of B given A. And all I'm going to do is take this equation and divide both sides by the probability of A. And I get this, probability of A and B is equal to the, uh, I'm sorry, probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A, okay? So, I mean, this, this is all we're doing. We're just rearranging terms based on the rules of algebra. The labels A and B are arbitrary. Um, and so I could just switch all of these around as long as I switch all the other letters around, OK? And I, I guess it's worth noting that the probability of A and B is the same as the probability of B and A, OK? So if you have an and thing, the order of the letters in here do doesn't matter. And these are just arbitrary labels, OK? So I could switch A and B around. And so what would, what is the probability of A given B then? Yeah, it's just the probability of A and B, or B and A, divided by the probability of B. Okay, because these are just the labels A and B are just are, are arbitrary. Okay, and so you have to ask, and did is the given piece of information that B has happened, or is the given piece of information that A has happened? Okay, and I know this feels all very abstract and weird, but uh, but let's uh, let's try a practical application of this. Okay. Are we feeling okay? Okay, so let's say um, Okay, so let's say um, if uh, the weather is clear the probability that a flight leaves on time is 0 0.9, OK? If um, there is a storm, so uh, we're just going to OK. Uh, I'm going to uh, simplify the world, and we'll say if, if it's not clear, that means storm, OK? So if the weather is not clear, meaning storm, probability of an on-flight time, or I'm sorry, on-time flight is now only 0 0.6. Okay, and let's say you check the weather, and they say the probability of clear weather is 0.7. Okay, so I'm going to ask.
what is the probability that your um, your flight is on time? So you, in these you're saying that the weather is clear and if the weather is not clear, not or. Huh? No, okay. No, you can't, you can't, the weather cannot be both clear and not clear at the same oh, time. Oh, I see, yeah, they okay. zero. So, yeah. so if the weather is clear, the probability that it leaves on time is 0.9, and if the weather is not clear, that drops down to 0 0.6. And the probability of clear weather is 0.7. Okay, so let's, let's, um, let's use, let's define all of these things. Okay, so let's start off. What is... 0.7, how would I represent this? I would say this is the probability of clear weather. Probability of clear weather is 0 0.7. Okay? Symbolically, how would I represent this number 0 0.9? Yeah, OK, so I'll say probability of on time given clear weather is equal to 0.9. OK, and then over here, 0.6 would be what? What goes inside here? So be like given Probability of being on time. Given like given clear not. I mean, okay, so not clear weather or clear weather complement, whatever you want to write, okay? So not clear weather. Okay, are we satisfied with this? Okay, and so I can and then this thing, what is this asking? What is the probability that your flight is on time? This is asking what is probability of being on time. Is that okay? All right, so um, I'm going to answer this two ways, and then we'll take a break here, okay? We're, we're going to get the same answer. Um, so we want to get what is the probability of being on time. Now there's two ways for us to be have an on-time flight. And what are they? I can have an on-time flight with clear weather. And I can also have an on-time flight without clear weather. Okay? Is there any other way for me to have an on-time flight? No. Can both of these happen? Can I have an on-time flight with clear weather at the same time as having an on-time flight with not clear weather? That makes it zero, right? Th those, those are mutually exclusive. So this thing and this thing are mutually exclusive, so I'm going to add these two together, okay? And I don't have to worry about subtracting any overlap because th there's no way for me to have both clear weather and not clear weather at the same time, okay? So how do I get the probability of on time and clear weather? So this is the probability of A and B So this is equal to the probability of um, clear weather times the probability of on time given clear weather, right? Is 
So far, so good. So all I'm doing is replacing A and B with clear weather and on time or whatever it might be. Okay. All right. This one, what does this become? So it's not going to be clear weather because it's not clear weather. right. Okay, so probability of I'm going to write not clear. I'm going to just say not clear times probability of on time given not clear. Is everyone okay with this? Yeah? <laughs> you guys aren't saying anything. Okay. All right. Well, do I have all of these numbers? Clear weather, what's that? 0.7, 0 0.7 times what's on time given clear weather? 0 0.9. Okay. What's the probability of having not clear weather? 0.6. Point six. So, so that's not given here, but we would have we can calculate this, right? So, probability of not cl if clear weather is 0.7, not having clear weather would be what? Yeah, one minus 0.7 or 0.3. Okay. So here I'm going to have 0.3 times on time and not clear. 0.6. So I get a total of 0 0.63 plus 0.18, and I get 0 0.81. So this is the probability of an on-time flight, given this information here. So if the weather is clear tomorrow, 70% chance of clear weather probability of an on-time flight would be 0.81. Is that, is that good? Okay. Let's, uh, let's do this again. I'm going to, this time I'm going to use what we call a probability tree. Okay, and some of you might prefer this method. Others of you like the, uh, will like the equation way that we just did. Okay, and so this is called the probability tree, and we're going to say, okay, we can, when we start off, we can either have clear weather, or it might not be clear. Okay, and what is the probability that we have clear weather? 0.7, okay, which means the probability that it's not clear is going to be. 0.3. Okay, so these two branches, anytime you have a node, they have to add up to one. Okay, and if it's clear weather, our flight can then be on time, or it might not on be not on time. Okay, and if it's not clear, it can also be on time but it might also be not on time. Okay. So if it is clear, what's the probability that it's on time? 0.9, which means the probability that it's not on time is 0.1. And over here, what's this number? Not clear, but on time, 0.6. 0.4. Okay. So then we ask, what's the probability that your flight is on time? Well, there's two ways we can get be on time. We can have on time and clear, and we can have on time and not clear. Okay. And so all we do here is we just multiply down the lanes. Okay. Because this 0.7 is really probability of clear, and this 0.9 is probability of on time given clear. And so, you know, 
I didn't write this out. So essentially when I multiply these two together, I'm getting probability of clear and on time, which is what we had written out earlier. So here I get 0.63, here I get 0.07, here I get 0.18, and here I get 0.12. Okay? And so being on time would then be this number plus this number. So the probability of being on time 0.63 plus 0 0.81. Did, did this work out okay? All right, so then let me ask a, a question here, okay? Um, let's say uh, you're going off to uh, pick someone up, okay? So let me just copy this, and we'll go to a new slide here. And I'm going to shrink this down a little bit. Okay, um, so let's say uh, you go to pick someone up, okay, and you see that the flight is on time. Okay, what is the probability? that the weather was not clear. Point six? No. Okay, so, so what are we asking here? So the piece of information that we know, the flight is on time. So this is given to us, okay? So I'm asking, what is the probability that the weather was not clear given the flight is on time, okay? So don't, don't mix that up with this. This is probability of on time given not clear. Okay. Over here I'm asking what's the probability that the weather was not clear if we see that the flight was on time. So these two things are different. Okay. And so just maybe to jog your mind probability of A given B is defined as probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. So whatever comes after the bar goes in our denominator here. Okay, so in this case, let's we're going to label not clear as A and on time as B. So I'm going to say, all right, this is going to be the probability of not clear and on time divided by the probability of what? Clear. No. So look, I got A and I've got B, and it's going to look like this. So I put A and B on top, not clear and on time on the top. And on the bottom, I put B. So what's B? On time. on time. So what is the probability that a flight is not clear and still on time? The weather is not clear and the flight's on time. What's the probability of that happening? Yeah. 
you guys see that? So I have to have a weather not clear. And then if the weather's not clear, I still have to get out on time. So what's the probability of that happening? 0.18. So 0.18 goes on top. OK, what's the probability that my flight is on time? 0.81, 0 .81, right? We've, we did that earlier, 0 .81. And so what do I get? Yeah, I think uh, point, oops, point 0.18 divided by point 0.81 is point 0.22222. Yeah. OK. So if the flight arrives on time, the probability that they left with not clear weather is 0.22222, okay? which is different from having not clear weather if you didn't know anything about it. Because right? if you didn't know anything, you just say the probability of not clear weather is 0.3. But the fact that they, got on, they were on time kind of lowers that chance that it was not clear. Does that make sense? Okay, let's take uh, a 10 minute break. We'll come, I'll get started back at 8.45.